My name is Eric Hollinger. I'm with the Smithsonian Natural History Museum Repatriation Office. My Klingit name is Duck Wu, adopted Duck Lawadi from Kilowell Chase and the Seal House, who it's Nua Kwan. Chiefs are coming this afternoon, and Gunnick Chiefs are bearing with us. Some of our slides were putting together a, a little bit at the last minute, and some of what you're seeing is 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 really real time. It's happening in the last week. It's happening last night. It's happening. Today it's happening minutes ago, <laughs> but not all the slides are up to date with that time. <laughs> but but the processes that we're talking about today are are uh, involved in that, and we'll be going on the next couple of days as well. So we hope you'll get to see some of this in action. And this session is is kind of a comprehensive 3D digitization and replication work uh, with multiple teams. And and starting out the presentation is CHI Cultural Heritage Imaging from California, and then we'll have a second presentation by Smithsonian show you what we've done with some of the Klingit work that we've done. And then a third presentation will be specifically about the Sculpin Hat replication project, which you may have read about or seen last night. So I'll turn it over to Carla and Mark. Great. So hello, good afternoon. So what we want to do is kick off this session and talk a little bit about some of our work and uh, especially about um, training class in photogrammetry that we just completed here, supported by the Alaska Heritage Institute. So I just want to give you a really brief overview of our organization. We are a nonprofit that's based in San Francisco and we've been around for 17 years. We believe that the treasures of humanity are worth saving. And so that is what drives what we do all the time, every day. And how we mainly focus on that is by helping communities and museums and people that care about cultural material to adopt photography-based imaging for documentation and preservation of their work. And our big idea is that the tools that are out there, which are still being developed, it can be adopted by the people that care about cultural heritage and that they can produce scientific, reliable documentation that can also be preserved so that these digitization records can be preserved and reused by others in the future. We just completed a photogrammetry training here. Um, we finished it on Tuesday, and the goals of that were to train staff and project partners for Sea Alaska Heritage and to focus on documenting and preserving uh, Northwest Coast art and to make representations of some selected pieces available for study specifically for Northwest Coast uh, emerging artists. Here are a couple of pictures from the training class. And one of the key projects that we focused on during the class was looking at, sh at shooting some of this, the house front that's there in their building. And so Mark is going to come up and show you some results that we got from some, some uh, test work and detail areas that we shot of that. Okay. And you can use the mic there if you want, or this, well, you can stand here. So it's, is this okay? Okay. As Carla is switching the computers, what I want to do is show you some 3D material that was captured using a monopod, a camera, and some lights to illuminate the front of the clan house in the Sea Alaska Heritage Institute. And Carla, do you want to just rotate that hor horizontally? A little more. OK. Oh, what I want to do is show you as you just stop for a second. You can start seeing, <laughs> tilt it that, like that. Tilt it at 45 degrees using the green line. Using okay. the green yeah. line, yeah. okay. All right. Now, stop. Okay, you can see here that you're starting to see some of the tool marks that were used to sculpt this out. And, you know, it's important for us to develop technologies that real people, normal people can adopt, right? Without thousands and thousands, tens of thousand dollars in gear, and just go out and do it. Because if the 
treasures of humanity's culture around the world are to be preserved in this catastrophic wave of cultural destruction we are in the middle of, it's going to take tens, hundreds of thousands of people out there doing this. And, you know, this is going to require communities taking responsibility for their culture, and that's going to require some methods that aren't very expensive and are pretty easy to use. So this is one of those things. You want to see the solid? This is yeah, the show me the... Now, this is, that was the picture that was on top of this model. Now I've removed the picture. And what we're seeing here in the actual surface of the model are the tool marks of the sculptor, uh, uh, Boxley, who carved it, right? You can do this with a digital camera if you know where to stand and point it. So fortunately, now we have 14 people who came through the class who know how to stand and point it that are members of this community or other Alaskan communities in Anchorage and elsewhere. And so, you know, the most important thing is to get out and do it. In this, there has been no human editing, no fiddling. This is just a result of standing in the right place, setting your camera to the right settings, and shooting a sequence of images. Okay, let's go. No, that's it. Okay, so, Sydney, you can do it. Let's see who else is through. Oh, Mike, Mike. <laughs> Mike Livingston from Anchorage can now do this stuff. And, you know, if you talk to them, it's possible for you, too, to do this stuff, right? And you can come to San Francisco and we'll teach you, or we could come back and do some more people. But, you know, the same issues that are important here are also important in Nigeria and for the original inhabitants of Australia and for people in Vietnam and Thailand and the Polynesians. The fundamental problem is, is that in all of these societies there was a destructive, catastrophic wave of colonialism that destroyed almost all of the original inhabitants' cultures. So now, everywhere in Nigeria, just like here, they're struggling with little money and with nothing but heart and love to go out, capture and preserve the objects of their heritage, and be and make them and preserve them in a way that they can pass them to their children, and children that haven't yet been born into that community. So, a hundred years, two hundred years, hopefully five hundred years from now, that object that they and their friends went out and spent the time to shoot the photographs around it will still be there. And we can do stuff to control the information about the capture such that if Sydney captured it, 200 years from now, people will still know Sydney captured it, right? And if Mike Livingston paid for the trip, Mike Livingston will also still be known as the person who saved that piece, right? So we're looking towards the deep future, but trying to come up with ways that normal people who spend four or five days and are willing to do a little extra study can do themselves. You don't need a college degree. And here's the cool thing. 
if you go out there and you never finished high school and you learn how to stand and you know how to set your camera and you capture something, right? There are tools now that can document what you did and prove to anybody that in fact you did it the right way your information is good, and it's good enough to stand toe-to-toe -to -toe with the British Museum, maybe even the Smithsonian, right? And your work can be part of the total knowledge base of humanity, or it can be held close within a tight community for their uses. The point is when you document your own culture, you're taking control of the narrative of that culture. If you have the proof, if you have the cultural objects, and you're the people who own those representations, you write the narrative, not the Metropolitan Museum of Art, you write the narrative. And again, you control what you share with the world and what you don't. And the point is, is that each local community around the world knows what's most important to them. And if Carla or I or the Smithsonian group went up by ourselves and tried to pick the most important stuff, we'd never get it right. I was down in the basement of the Sea Alaska Heritage Institute, and they have all these beautiful things, and I was saying, boy, that would be a beautiful thing to shoot. That would be a beautiful thing to shoot. And Sydney would pat me on the shoulder and say, these are the most important things right here, okay? So that's something to think about. About five Okay. Um, you know, it's not only in Nigeria and up here in Southeast Alaska that people are trying to recover their heritage. There's a tiny little country in Europe called Albania that had a brutal communist dictator until the early 90s. And he was destroying culture, Christian culture, Muslim culture, any culture he could, poets, everything they collected up and they burned. And people held stuff under their beds. And when somebody would come looking for someone who had something, they'd pass it to somebody on the roof and they'd pass it to the next roof to preserve it, right? Pretty cool group. They are so passionate to recover their culture, they're bringing us in along with Eric Landsberg, who used to do museum photography at the Museum of Modern Art. And we're building a national digitization center and also setting up knowledge sites in local communities in several places around the country. And it's not just you guys, the catastrophe has been almost universal. But here's the point. If each local community takes control of documenting their culture and deciding what to share, what not to share, here's what happens. Suddenly, the record of human culture that is shared becomes far richer than if 500 well-meaning, well-funded groups from North America and Europe and Japan and China went around and tried to pick and save human culture. The one thing we'll never get even scratch the surface of what's going to be lost, especially concerning what's going to happen with global warming. And it's only you guys who are going to be able to do the job. So we're happy to teach you, and everybody we teach, we say, please teach someone else so that we get these. Um, You're about out of time. What yeah. Do you want to do? Okay. 
I'm about out of time, but I'm all, that's about all I need to say. <laughs> okay, so I'm going to skip through some of this stuff. Okay. And come down here. And Basically, we also have, you know, a tool that Carla will talk about later that makes scientific imaging far simpler than it is today. And we'll also record all the steps that we talked about so you can prove your stuff is good. And the beauty is, is that separates authority from the authenticity of the work. And right now it's like if the British Museum does something or Un University of California Berkeley does something, people say, okay, I guess I can trust it because Berkeley did. This new work that's happening will allow you to stand toe to toe with them. But anyway, I'm gonna give the floor back to Carla. Thanks for listening. Okay. So uh, Mark was alluding to a set of tools that we've been working on called the Digital Lab Notebook, or DLN. And we're really grateful to have a grant from the National Endowment for the Humanities right now uh, to develop these open source free uh, software tools that will allow people to collect information about how they did the imaging and validate the image sets as being correct for a couple of different imaging technologies, which I'm going to show you in a minute and also give them support for creating archival submission packages. So it isn't about just about collecting images so that we can look at things right now, but also what do we do with that data for the future? And how do we make sure that the data is reusable for the future and not just pretty pictures, but people can figure out what it is and what they can rely on. So the big idea is we want lots of people with digital cameras that know how to apply these techniques so that they can capture for themselves and their communities what's important to them using these different technologies. And at Cultural Heritage Imaging, we work in the field of computational photography. And what we mean by that is that instead of taking a single image, we're taking image sequences and using computer algorithms to pull information across that sequence of images so that we get a new kind of thing, a new representation that's not possible from one image by itself. And there are many examples of this. Uh, we primarily focus on reflectance transformation imaging, or RTI. I'm going to show you a couple quick examples photogrammetry. You've seen uh, some examples. I have a couple more. Uh, but the idea here is that it's also easy for people to get their hands on digital cameras and to learn these techniques and to build on them so that they have a great tool set. So let me just quickly show you an RTI example. And I'm going to start with this. Uh, it's a, from the Johns Hopkins Archaeological Museum. And with an RTI, we're collecting both shape and color information just from one camera point of view. So unlike a 3D model, we can't spin it around. But from that one camera point of view, we can change the lighting to any, any direction. I'm going to zoom in so we can look at some details. In this case, this is a Greek uh, vase material. And the archaeologist was very interested in looking at the original designs and how they were painted on the surface, you can see right here that the back of the soldier was actually painted, even though there was always going to be a shield just, you know, to keep their, uh, to keep, to keep track of things and get their proportions correctly. And then these almost disappear when they've been painted over. But with this technique, we can see these very fine surface details. And that allows us, especially can take the color out here, to see these kinds of changes that were made to the design. So in the, in the dress here, you can see that part of it used to come back uh, down, farther here, and so forth. So Sanchita Balachandran, who's the researcher working on this, has been taking this technique after training from us and going to many different museums after she imaged the ones in her, in her collection and is doing a study of this kind of material for ancient Roman uh, art. Here's another example uh, actually from Smithsonian that we shot as part of a workshop that we gave there. And uh, the idea here is just that you can see the really fine details on the edge of this lithic. And here I have it with no color. You can see all the little touches and retouches. Um, we've done it on a lot of petroglyphs. So it's, it's really great for things where surface details matter. Um, the basic idea is the camera and the subject are in a fixed position, and we take a sequence of images with light in different positions around the subject, and that's how we create these RTIs. Um, so there's your basic setup. 
Uh, I'm just, and also it's open source software available from our website and there's some instructional videos and user guides and so forth that are available. So we, you've already seen a photogrammetry result. I just want to take a couple minutes and give you a little uh, background and show you a couple more examples. So the idea with photogrammetry is that we want to create a 3D digital surface that replicates the actual subject as closely as we can in shape and color. And we also want to create photographic sequences that are useful in the future. And that means they need to be able to be qualitatively evaluated by others, reused by others, and preserved for future generations. To get started, this is the basic equipment that you need. You need a digital SLR camera that you can lock down into manual mode. You need a monopod so you can move the camera around. And you need some way to put scale in the subject so that you can measure how far things are in your subject. These are um, calibrated scale bars that the computer can automatically detect. You can obviously add to this kit with lighting and things like that, depending on what you're shooting and what your needs are, but it doesn't take a whole lot to get started with this technique. Um, I'm going to show you a couple of examples, and I just want to note, as Mark said, that these are just directly from the photogrammetry software. We're not doing any editing or smoothing or hole filling, which you will often see in uh, 3D examples that are shown. We did a project with Aboriginal rock art in uh, Western Australia and the Dampier Peninsula. Uh, here's a few pictures of the kind of petroglyphs that are there. And they asked us not to shoot or share any uh, rock faces that had anthropomorphic images. So of course we have uh, honored that. And whoops, I just realized that in the mad rush <laughs> to get this uh, uh, up, I don't have that demo running. Give me just a moment. Is it on my, By the way, I, I'd actually, like you know what? Uh, that piece of, of the uh, house panel I showed you was shot by Brian Wallace and um, Mike Livingston. Okay, just to give credit to the people who, yeah, and we deserve it. We shot a bigger area of the clan of the house front, and uh, but Mark just built a small area. That's what we could do on our portable laptop. But what he showed you, which you didn't say, is there was 11 million faces in that one small area, and really uh, nailed it down. I'm actually going to skip this example for time and go straight to the Olmec head. So this is a replica Olmec head that's in San Francisco that we shot as part of a training class. It weighs 14 tons. It's it's nine feet tall. Um, and so here we have the, um, the 3D model. The blue rectangles are showing you the, the camera positions, how the, how the cameras were moved around the subject here. And what we're looking at here is the dense cloud. I'm going to turn the cameras off so you can, so you can see the, the results. This is the dense cloud for it um, with 68 million points. Whoops. What happened? My computer died. I need. A, I didn't even bring it in here. It was fully charged. It's been 20 minutes. <laughs> yeah, it's out there by the table. Uh, I'm sorry, but I'll just I'll keep going for a minute and um, see if I can remember what else I'm supposed to do. I have like five minutes left. <laughs> that is so sad. Um, okay, so wow, it just completely died. Thank you. So I think the yeah. <laughs> I think the key thing that we want to say is that there are tools out there that you can apply yourselves to document, preserve, share, study, and make sure that people in the future can have access to cultural material. And we want to, our job as a nonprofit and, and why we founded this corporation 17 years ago is so that we can help people to do that for themselves. And so all of our work is around that. And you saw the Olmec head. I don't think I had, oh, I had the Diego Rivera. I'm just like doomed here. I'm doomed. My computer has died. Okay. Nope, it's back. Whew. All right, so you saw the Olmec head. Um, I want to close with this Diego Rivera mural project. And this is um, Diego Rivera mural that's in San Francisco. 
that was painted as part of a World's Fair in 1940. It's huge. It's 22 feet by 74 feet. And uh, I say it, it, it has an original title called The Marriage of the Artistic Expression of the North and of the South on this Continent, but is now known as Pan-American Unity. Uh, he did a charcoal drawing. It's a classic uh, wet plaster fresco technique that it was done. And here you can, you can get a sense of the scale. We shot it with, uh, by mounting our flash units and a camera in a lifter and four days doing a lot of going up and down and rejiggering uh, to make this work. And what I'm gonna do is, is actually just go to the demo. One of the reasons we did this is that there, this mural will be moved it's been moved before. It was painted on 10 panels, though five of them weigh two tons and five of them weigh three tons. But it's going to go into the San Francisco Museum of Modern Art for three years and then go back to a different building at City College of San Francisco. And this is just an artist's rendition of where it's going. And so they wanted really good documentation of it before it moves because it's obviously a little risky. But also it has helped the conservators understand um, where it's where there are cracks and uh, issues that they might be need to be concerned with. So we built a very high resolution uh, 3D model of this surface and we decided that the best way to share that was as two-dimensional information. So from our 3D information, we can generate two-dimensional results. And we're partnering with Stanford University Libraries and this is a prototype that's gonna be public, um, we hope, soon in the next few months. Uh, but here we have the mural and you can start to see, like we can zoom in and just see enormous amounts of detail. This is just over the Wi-Fi here, the public Wi-Fi at the museum. Um, so we can see a lot of the, of the detail. This is as far as we can, we can zoom in that far. So we can see all of the detail of, this hasn't totally popped in yet, okay. Um, all of the detail of the mural in the, the, the color of the mural. But the other thing that we've done is we've created a two-dimensional view called a digital elevation model that shows the surface. So this is a false color way of showing the surface shape, uh, but in two dimensions. So here we have that same shaman's face and you can see Rivera's brushstrokes in the plaster. And we can see uh, here, actually if I back out, sometimes you can see more, we can see the, the Jornada lines where the dry pl wet plaster was laid up next to the dry plaster and so forth. And they've created a little uh, opacity slider so I can put a little color in or out. So this is gonna be available for anybody to view in the next few months. We've been work working out all the final legal and other details, but we're really excited to share this. The total 2D image is 7.4 gigapixels or 7.4 billion pixels. We have a sample of shape and color, 38 samples per square millimeter for 22 feet by 74 feet. So this is the biggest project we've done, but um, we're really proud of it. And I am going to end, um, I'm gonna end there. The only other thing I wanna do is just um, say, we, if you come back to the digitization room, we have some postcards and things and other stuff to show. If anybody's interested, we're happy to talk to folks while we're around today and tomorrow. And I will turn it back over to Eric. Actually, we have to transition a little bit, so let, why don't you guys keep talking? Okay. We'll, uh, <laughs> uh, who wants to mark? Well, why don't we ask some questions? Yeah. See if there are questions. Questions while, uh, while we're getting set up. Sure. Ours. Are you going to use this computer or no? So, so yeah. Yeah. what do you think? Right, right there. Make sure we nope. get the position. Cool. What do you want to know about it? But, uh, actually, do you want me to unplug? First, right? Do you have display? Bring it. Where in San Francisco are you located? Exactly. Our office is in a neighborhood called the Dog Patch, which okay. is next to San Francisco Bay, and it's about a mile south of the baseball stadium. Oh, I know at, exactly where you're talking about. At AT&T Park. So we do trainings. Uh, we do trainings there every few months. And uh, we also are happy to help write grants to come up, especially if there's five or more people who want to learn this sort of thing. And nothing would make me happier to get this disseminated as far as possible into the community here. 
Well, my name is David Strong. I work with the Chilkat Indian Village Tribal Government. They sent me over here so I can see what you guys are doing here. We'd like something like this in Klaquan. So if you guys have a business card or something. Oh, yeah, we do. We can get a hold of you guys. Back to the glasses. Hold on, Carla. Answer the next question. I have a question. So I have a question um, that I know the answer to, but I think people here might want to know is um, like how much computer power do you need? How much more computer power you need? Yeah. yeah, and I would say for the RTI, not that much. That will work on really pretty basic computers mm -hmm. to, for photogrammetry, um, a lot. How many images you shoot and the goals of, of resolution uh, that you have, but there are some services that can process data for you. You don't have to process it yourself. And also, our view, particularly for material that's at risk, is to go take the photos because then we have the information, even if you don't have the ability to process it right away. So it can take a lot of computer power to process the the, the high resolution models. Um, not as much, obviously, for the lower resolution models. Um, and the RTI, not an issue at all. Why don't I give you this so you can Kay. move away from the computer and then I can okay. I just brought that keep up talking. And should be on well, where is this it? is an important point to stress because image. if you keep track of the information sense. about the subject sure and what it, equipment yeah. you use and who does the imaging, and you um, put that together with the photos you shoot and take that and put it into a preservation environment like at one of the libraries or if you, you know, have a clan based server for doing this sorts of things or on the cloud, you've documented it. If it goes away tomorrow, you have all the information just in the photographs to rebuild the whole thing in 3D and measure it and have measured drawings you give to a carver and say, look, this was the, the hat. And this is, you know, exactly its dimension. Here's the slope of the top and would you please carve this for me again? And if you decide to change it, great. But here's, here's what your ancestor did. OK, here you go, Eric. Sheesh, thank you, thank you. Want to give him a round of applause for uh, that great presentation? <laughs> yes? Oh. For these guys? Yeah. OK. Um, I'm wondering about um, if I digitize somebody's at U, uh, who owns that data? Um, what's, what's the procedure there? So once we digitize stuff, it has a tendency to creep out into the world and be less controllable. Uh, I'm sure you guys have thought about that. Um, how would you answer that? The, yeah, well, I, I'll, I'll take a no, short no, no, no. shot and then I'll hand yeah. it off to you okay. because you deal with this all the time. But okay. for us, because we work with a lot of different communities around the world, um, so people have different ideas about what they want to share and what they want to keep. Um, and so, yes, there there is a risk associated with that that I think that people have to understand. And there are ways to dis to make distinctions, like the group we worked with in... Uh, Australia, they had some material that they were perfectly happy to share and have shared, and they had some material that they did not want shared. And so, obviously, if they're working with somebody like us, we have to give them control of the data. They have to have a repository, a way to control that data so that it doesn't go out to other people. But our idea is about empowering local communities so they can make those, those choices for themselves. The copyright and ownership is like, you know, whole conferences on that topic, so I'm not going to try to answer that one. For us, if we're asked to digitize Atu that's owned by the clan or a house, the clan or the house owns the, the, the files on that. 
but what is done with those files then is a matter of then working together to decide what's appropriate for that because some may be uh, um, open to some use like you saw with the sculpin hat others may not be comfortable with that so tribe by tribe clan by clan house by house it's it's a challenge because museums like to own what they if somebody produces something with their own technology we use Smithsonian computers to do the work or something like that usually the policy is that's ours and uh, so one of the things we try to do to make a distinction here, as you'll see in the workshop, if you're able to come after the talks today and over the next two days, we have a workshop right down the hall in the classroom here, just uh, 30 feet away, got to come and see it in action. And we use uh, an authorization form that uh, makes it clear that all we're doing is digitizing for security in case something happens, the house burns down or something like that. These files are there as a backup that could be drawn upon if desirable for something like a repair or someone could give those files to a traditional carver and say, here's a guide for you. It's better than the three photos that I have from uh, 20 years ago or something like that that they could use. It's up to them how to, it's used, but it provides an option, a backup. And um, uh, the form specifically says we will not uh, publish photographs, we won't put anything up on the web, we won't make 3D prints or replicas of it without more explicit permission from them case by case. Because they might be comfortable one day telling the story of a hat on the web, in which case, you know, might, but that might be five years down the road when they consult more among their clan, and then they might ask for that story to be put on the web and they want to use that model to create that. So it's challenging though, yeah. If you're in control of documenting your own treasures, you can design a place where you have computers that hold that data that aren't plugged into the internet. And if they're not plugged into the internet and you don't have somebody going in there who's not authorized to get to that computer, it's not going anywhere, right? Even Mr. Putin can't get it if he if he wants. Thanks, sir. Thank you, Gunakshish. We're already running way behind, so we're going to, this is going to be speed dating with the Smithsonian, and we have a, a, a team of people that will be speaking uh, in rapid sequence and introducing themselves as they go and why they're talking. All right. Thanks, Eric. Um, so I'll keep this really quick, but I want to give you an overview of the 3D scanning efforts at the Smithsonian. So I'm Vince Rossi. I lead the 3D program. Um, we're a pan-institutional office, so we work for all the different museums. So the Smithsonian, we're not one museum, we're 19 different museums, nine research centers, um, and we have this really huge collection. We have over 155 million objects, and less than 1% of those objects can ever be on physical display. We just don't have enough buildings to display at all. So that really, this is what inspires our team, right? We have all these amazing objects that we, in this privileged position of employees, we can go behind the scenes, see that stuff. Um, but our team's goal is to really figure out how to scale up 3D technology so that we can unlo unlock more of this collection for the world. Um, quick little spotlight project I'll talk about. Um, we were fortunate enough to be able to 3D scan Neil Armstrong's spacesuit. This is in collaboration with the Air and Space Museum, funded by a Kickstarter um, project. Um, you can check it out. There's a URL on the screen. Uh, you could also Google Armstrong spacesuit 3D and it will pop up. So we're able to do a surface 3D scan, high resolution surface scans, then we also did CT scanning and we're able to combine all those different data sets. So we can actually do things with this object that you couldn't do with the real object. We could peel away layers um, and look inside this object. And what our team really likes to do and what our goal is, and hopefully this video will play in a second, if we're still connected to the internet, let's see. Oh, damn, I need to request access. <laughs> that, that will not play right now. But I promise you it was a really cool animation. Yeah. yeah. Um, <clears throat> but that was a one-off project, and we, we do some of those projects. But what we're thinking about now is how do we scan entire collections? Um, so we've done a number of pilot projects where we um, set up a high-throughput 3D scanning device, and that's... Um, really what our team is doing. And when, as we're scanning these collections of objects, we hit all kinds of pain points, lots of technical problems. So in no way is 3D scanning a, a push button operation, but our team is taking steps to automate um, a lot of these manual steps that we know can be automated. And we're doing that through the creation of our, our own pipeline um, that allows us to preserve this data for future generations, process it in a more automated way, 
author content in a standardized way so that we get extensibility to any platform that leverages 3D data. So as we 3D scan Neil Armstrong's spacesuit, we can launch that on the Smithsonian 3D viewer, but we can also deploy it onto a VR platform or AR platform or any platform that leverages 3D data. Uh, and here's a quick picture of the, the setup. So you can see on the left, so an array of cameras and a motion control system, a turntable, um, and the Smithsonian 3D team doing some of the processing work. Um, we also scanned the, the T-Rex, and this is really our goal, is how do we use this technology as kind of a scaffolding for storytelling? So how can we use the T-Rex scan to educate children around the world? So anyone with an internet device, connected device, can, can learn about the object. And at that, I'll pass it off to Eric, and I'll get him connected. Yep, absolutely. Is it still on? I think, they, man I think they manually switch it back there. Are we on? Yeah. OK, thank you. So we're going to switch to a different laptop, because this is all about technology, right? We couldn't get them working together on the same laptop. <laughs> so we got to have this is why we have three different teams from different parts of the country here, because we can't all get the technology to work together. So uh, it's but it's it's the technology is coming along so rapidly. It has so much potential uh, so that it's things that 10 years ago we never would have thought were possible are being done, as you as you see from this. And did you mention that you scanned the space shuttle? I did not. You, you, they yeah. scanned the space shuttle. We have a space shuttle in our collections, and they scanned it. And that was uh, you, how many millions, hundreds of millions, or billions of points of data uh, that was? Yeah, it was sixty thousand high resolution images and hundreds of laser scans. So right. and fleas, tiny things, uh, big and big and little. So we're going to go right on to examples of some of the projects that we've done. I guess we'll uh, turn that to you guys. You want to try and use this mic? Are you going back and forth? Oh, uh, talks. Can somebody take the Sorry microphone? Could somebody take the microphone, okay. please? Yeah, Thank you. <laughs> and uh, so, the first Klingit 3D project we did involved this killer whale hat uh, that was in our collections since uh, 1908 and was repatriated to Mark Jacobs Jr., who found it in the collections along with his son Mark. This was repatriated to him in 2005 on New Year's Day. He passed away 11 days later with it on his bed. And uh, two years later, Edwell John was installed as the new caretaker for the collections and the, the clan leader. And um, Edwell is familiar with computing technology, it does computer training, and so he knew about some of the potentials for computers. And he asked if we could digitize it uh, for uh, security if something happened to it and the possibility of making something from it. So he envisioned that was a possibility. And we asked him, uh, if we're going to digitize it, then could we, would you allow us to go ahead and try to make a replica so we could teach about repatriation and teach about these kinds of objects at the Smithsonian? Because it's hard to do displays about repatriation because you've given it back. You could show some pictures of it, and some communities aren't comfortable with scenes of repatriations happening. And, uh, but this would allow us maybe to uh, to continue to teach with it, but not interrupt the use of the sacred. Uh, so he allowed us to digitize it, and the digitization program office helped us with that, and Smithsonian Institution exhibits, I think, at, at that time. And uh, so they made 3D uh, models of it, and then uh, it was uh, milled. And actually, Chris, since we don't have a in here, why don't you tell about the milling process with this? Right. This hat was... Uh, the board for the cameras. Yeah. What was that? Getting the cameras. Oh, okay. <laughs> uh, this hat was milled uh, in alder from uh, on our uh, four axis CNC mill, and it was uh, machined from multiple sides. Here you can see the beginning stages where it's being roughed out, uh, and then it would have to go through a uh, drying period of about 30 days before the uh, finishing would happen. And with the CNC machining, you essentially get your uh, 3D data after it's been processed, and then you have to go through a whole process of programming it, uh, directing cool tool paths for, for the CNC machine. So you have to decide the direction you want to cut it in. Generally, you're going to want to be going with the grain rather than across the grain. So it's a lot like uh, sitting down with a chisel and a hammer and actually uh, hand carving something out of a piece of wood, except in this case, your chisel and your hammer are the computer and the CNC milling machine. Okay, thanks. And the uh, once it was milled, you see uh, there was a test 
piece there that was that was done because uh, you don't want to make a mistake with the uh, computer programming in it. So sometimes they'll do a prototype piece. And in this picture, you see two there. And then they also used it to as a test for the paint. How would the paint go on there? This was made entirely without having access to the original. It was only done through scans and photographs. So the artist that painted it uh, had to use only photographs for comparison for it. And it was revealed at the uh, Sharing Our Knowledge Conference in 2012 in Sitka. And this is Edwell John when he first saw it, when it was revealed, they pulled back the robe that was covering it. And he was very impressed with it. He was very happy. This is it on exhibit now. It's on exhibit at the Natural History Museum uh, while the original is in use by the Klan. And one unique thing with this is we, the agreement with the Klan is that we can display and exhibit this as long as we make it clear it's a replica. He wants to make it sure that people know that it's not Atu that's on exhibit there. And the Klan has the right to check it off exhibit and dance with it as regalia. So they have come to DC twice and danced it sometimes together with the original hat as regalia. Yeah, can you tell which is which? Yeah, the original's on the left. It's actually already a little darker from handling in the few years after it was repatriated. That's the replica. Now this brings us to the Huna project next. This led to the next project uh, with working with Huna Indian Association. Bob Starbert is here. He authorized us to uh, undertake this project where we repatriated 53 objects to Huna Indian Association. And they were interested in 3D replication for a little bit different purpose. These are shamanic funerary objects. And so there's the concern that yake are in the objects. They also have mercury on them. The red paint, actually all the bright red paint from this era is probably mercury. That's what we found from our testing. And so it may pre present a chemical hazard as well as a spiritual hazard. And the objects, of course, are fragile. Bob and Huna felt that they had such great educational teaching potential that if 3D replicas could be made, that they could still be used for teaching and handling without those risks associated with it. So we CT scan these, and in this case, this series is the interior structure. You can see the beads there in the bottom of this rattle. So we can see things that, that aren't, we can tell whether they're steatite beads or, or iron, um, sometimes lead weights or things like that. And you see in the top there, you see that red? That's mercury in the paint. The CT scan x-rays actually bounce off that like it's metal, so we can actually map the mercury on it through that. So it tells a lot more about the object. And then Carolyn took over. Um, yeah, so I, I took the CT scan data, and I, just so you know, the CT scan data doesn't have quite the resolution as, say, photogrammetry or the high-end um, scanners. Um, so I did have to do a, just a little bit of uh, cleanup on it. Um, and as you saw, when it was being scanned, it was in a box. Um, so it was safe in its, in its uh, box that, as it is in the collection. And I was able to remove the box from the scan digitally. And um, so, the, so then I just basically cleaned up the, the CT scan. Um, we, as, from the, as the scan revealed, the beads were inside. So when it was scanned, you see all, they're all lumped together. So if I was, our replica was 3D printed. So if I was to 3D print that, um, they would all be just a big mass. So I went in and individually extracted each bead and um, separated it from each other. Digitally. 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 <laughs> digitally. And um, so, so in my file, they were floating around and not touching anything. So our printer is, um, is able to, uh, I don't know if you're familiar with 3D printing, but it's able to print uh, without support. We use a, a gypsum-based printer, and the powder itself is the support. So when the print is done, you have wherever there was data, you have a solid object, and then um, you're able, so this rattle had um, holes. There's the taking it out of the printer. So the, uh, the rattle had uh, some slices, some gaps where they went together. So we printed it all as one. But I was able to get in there with um, an air hose and blow out all the powder inside. And so, um, and so this is it coming out of the printer. I actually, our printer prints in color, but we didn't have the color data. Um, for this object. So I printed it, um, color matched the wood color, so I was able to print it in, in with a, a base wood color. Um, and then that's, uh, let's see, just a little more detail. The, 
So once it comes out of this printer, you have to infiltrate it because it's, it's sort of in its green state, it's very fragile. So we soaked it in um, an epoxy resin. But since the beads were in there, I had to keep moving the rattle around as the resin was curing so the beads would not stick to the rattle inside. So a very tedious process. Um, and so after all that, and then luckily we had the original, and um, I hand painted it to match the original. Um, like Eric said, often we do not have an original to paint to, but when we do, it's it's incredibly helpful. It's invaluable, actually. Yeah, it's very invaluable. And you can see that in the next room. Yep, we have the replica in, in our room. So we're working together with an Indian association to try to apply this to around 33 objects that are physically appropriate. This There are robes and some other objects and uh, uh, leather aprons that may not be as good uh, for it. And you can see they have uh, hair attachments on some of these in leather, and those Carolyn has to erase yeah. in those. In this shot, you see CT scans, and again, you see the uh, mercury in the red paint there that adds some thickening to it. You want to talk about that? Uh, about di the digital repair yes about the digital repair um, yeah so the the head was let me see I'm trying to remember okay, this yeah. one. Go ahead. So the head on the original, as you see in the top, was missing. And uh, Bob decided that that uh, doesn't quite have the educational value that a complete one does if they can't tell it's an oyster catcher rattle. So he wondered if it could be restored. And so Carolyn took the head off that other rattle that you had and digitally grafted it on and side, had to size it down to the, uh, to, the, to the size to fit it. Right. So that right. enabled the printing of a complete rattle, which is also in the next room, and you can see. As far as we know, it's the first digital repair of a cultural object. And then here's another one with the it, rattles. It's another rattle with the beads inside. And you had yep. to erase the teeth. We on had this. to erase the teeth, the hair. Um, yeah. Any any part of it that's uh, hair, teeth, shells, um, all those things are always removed. And, uh, and we'll use real ones. And we'll use real ones in them. Yep. This is Chris. This next uh, example is uh, a point in the project where I uh, was asked to uh, make a, a one of a pair of dance wands uh, to essentially collaborate with the Ahuna Tunum Corporation since they have a ICNC router up there for making signs for the tourist industry. And uh, the process of this portion was to basically set up all the digital files so they would be machine ready and then send them up to uh, HUNA where they could be machined up there. And as part of the, the, the pilot, we wanted to basically go through a proof down here where I would set everything up, make sure everything was uh, scaled properly, fixtured properly, and then I would go ahead and machine one. And then we would also send the same exact file up to Huna, have them do uh, one up there, and send back the piece that they machined so we could compare the results. That way we could gauge whether or not uh, we could have a, a very open collaboration back and forth between us and the people in Huna. So that wasn't the original plan, though. The original plan was for Chris to mill things that were flat like that and for Carolyn right. to print the things that had interior structure and complexity. Right. Or the but, when, but when we went to Huna and did the signing and, and uh, Bob tore me around and we talked about what they had the capabilities for doing, we, we learned of the CNC capability. And that, so Chris sent the files as a test mm -hmm. and they milled this wand in Huna and they mailed it to us and put them side by side and they're identical. So having demonstrated that Huna actually has the physical technology to produce these objects there, Bob said, don't mill anymore at the Smithsonian. We'll mill them all in Huna in the future. And so they're working on, and working on getting some more technology to be able to do a greater range and do bigger and more objects in the future. And so where we are on that, we still have some more objects to finish out, but we've printed most of the objects for printing, milled a few objects. And, and, occasionally and the plan is for artists from Huna to come and finish them. That's why the ones you'll see, except for the first one that Carolyn painted, are awaiting being painted by Huna artists and awaiting hair attachments by Huna artists. Because Bob said, well, you could do the 3D uh, printing and the milling, but we have artists that can do all that, so we'll finish it. So please come to the uh, come to the classroom and, and check out the samples and uh, see what we're working on. Why don't on. you pass that one around? Sure. Yeah. 
The next project that we did was with Klingit spear throwers. And uh, if you've seen in the program, there is actually a presentation and several workshops on Klingit spear throwers. Rich Vanderhoek is presenting, and I don't know when because I don't, still haven't gotten over there to get a program. Uh, but uh, it's I, I highly recommend it. I think I'm a co-author on it still. Uh, and uh, Klingit spear throwers are very rare. There's only uh, there were maybe 12 known in museums when we started the project. Now we think there's about 26 that we know of, and they're all in museums. None are in tribal possession anymore. And Smithsonian Natural History Museum had two, and there was speculation among scholars that they were not functional or that they might be shamanic objects. They're very short for Arctic spear throwers. They're elaborately carved, and so it was kind of a debate. So we realized with this technology, and working with uh, Klingit Haida Central Council with Harold Jacobs, we CT scanned them, and we took them outside and threw spears with them. So we think they work. And uh, this is outside the collections facility where we house them, and we gave them a try. And then we sent a pair up to Rich Vanderhoek, who's speaking, and he's a spear thrower expert from Anchorage, and uh, asked him what he thought. And, and uh, uh, he thinks they work. Here's Harold testing them out at the facility. and. Uh, giving it a try with throwing. And uh, we think that they, I think that's the last slide though, but we actually have some here for you. That first set that you see was kind of a rough print. We just wanted to see, could we physically produce that shape and throw with them? And so we, we figured out, okay, it works. And then we wanted to see, and that was done with CT scans. As Carolyn said, they're not as high resolution. So we wanted to get the best art we could. And so we went to Joe. Yeah, uh, so I'm Joe Conrad. I work with the digitization program office. Uh, yeah, like Eric said, we 3D scanned these a couple times. The first time around, we scanned them with a structured light scanner, which Come on over to the demo room. We have them. Uh, scans at a resolution of about a tenth of an inch, or uh, 0.1 millimeters. And once we had that, the, we looked at the data with Eric. We had him 3D printed, and it just looked a little soft. It didn't capture the quality of the originals uh, like we want, like we had hoped. Uh, so we got out the big guns. We got out the uh, the Faro 3D laser scanner uh, that scans at a resolution of 75 microns, and that allowed us to capture the most minute details, very very sharp edges. Uh, it just created a more uh, a better a better model uh, compared to the other mod or compared to the earlier version. So once we had that, uh, we th had them 3D printed. Uh, I handed them back to Eric. Eric did some uh, painting, and he uh, he also put in some shell inlays uh, for them. And we also have those in the room for you to look at as well. But Joe did something special for us with those, and you can see that one of them has shell inlays in it. And on the scans, uh, it just sees the exterior layer of that. It can't tell that a shell versus paint versus something else. So Joe went into the computer and sculpted it out, right? Is that how you did it? Yep. And, and, and excised that area. We had some that were parts that were missing shell, some that didn't. So he knew how deep those holes were. So he extrapolated that in, removed the shell. So when he printed it, it had gaps where all the shell had been. And then I was able to put shell and lay in it. So when you see that, it's it's pretty hard to tell the difference between the real one with shell and lay, and that uh, and the copy as you see it going around. Now, if you want to throw with these and learn how it was done, then look in the program for Rich Vanderhoek's workshop, and he is going to be behind the Andrew Hope building for those workshops. So he's in that back alley, you know, spearing anybody that walks by. And, uh, no, uh, he's got a little area set up. It'll be safe, I guarantee it. And it, it, it's it's really fun. This is how probably all of our ancestors hunted for tens of thousands of years before the bow and arrow, and then the bow and arrow replaced it. And we did find an account from 1788 of, I think, young men or kids in Sitka Harbor uh, hunting seals or otters with spear throwers. So we have historical accounts that says, yeah, they did use these as well. So try that out. Um, and then that was our, and that's still ongoing. We're still working with that. We gave a pair to Central Council of these for them to share with culture camps so they could reintroduce it to the kids, uh, remind them that they used to throw and used to hunt with this, and maybe uh, inspire carvers to start carving them again. So a new form of cultural restoration using 3D technology. And that then brings us to the next talk. So that might be a good cutoff point for the video that they're cutting for us. And that goes us to the Sculpt and Hat presentation. Is there any questions? Uh, yeah. Questions? Want to keep rolling? On to the next one. So the Sculpt and Hat presentation, how many of you were here last night? 
Okay, a few of you missed it though. So sorry for the rehash, but uh, maybe we'll get a little more in depth. But the Kick City Sculpin Hat. In 2012, Harold Jacobs was visiting us and uh, found a, a, a hat, a broken hat in the collections. Presentation mode. Ah, well, where am I? Ah, I meant to go. There we go. No. Oh, yeah. mm -hmm. Apologies. <coughs> That's better. Thank you. So he found the hat in the collections, and it was just the piece on the left at that time. And he asked us, uh oh, it's automated. Um, mm. We don't want it moving on us. And uh, he recognized that it uh, was badly broken, cracked in multiple places, missing a lot of attachments and pieces on it. And so uh, it, it really couldn't be danced again. And, uh, but he, he had worked with us on the Killer Whale Hat project. And so he asked, could you apply the same technology to this? Could you digitize it and then repair it in the computer and then use the, the CNC milling to create a new hat and paint it? And we said, we think we could do that. And he said, I think if you do that, I think the Kick City would want to kill money on it and bring it out and restore it to use. And so he introduced us to Ray Wilson in 2012 at the Sharoner Knowledge Conference, and we talked to Ray about it, and he said, yeah, I think we want to try that, and it began seven years of collaboration. Here you see how badly damaged it is in the interior, too. It had 175 holes in it, and uh, from where it had been repaired and had attachments on it back in the, in the days. It was collected in 1884 in Sitka by John J. McLean, and while we were investigating it, we found that it had a second piece with it. Uh, the, the collector's notes actually said it, it was a large wooden hat with wooden stovepipe attachment, but they weren't together at the time. So we searched our collections and we found this in, uh, that he had also sent in and we realized they went together. They'd been separated for 125 years. We did some testing of the paint, matched some green drops of paint on the rim and we think they match up with XRF to support that maybe they dribbled a little green paint on it when they were painting the cylinder. So then that led to uh, um, Ray asked clan leaders to visit with him and, and examine the object uh, to study it and figure out what to do with it and how to um, work with it. By studying it, it had, we think it had holes in it that were from sea lion whiskers attachments had rows of holes on the back there and it, we see evidence that they took the whiskers out and then they kind of painted over that area with with kind of a mud slip you see it's kind of tan there but they didn't paint that area so we think maybe they had some cover in there like a cape in that area and that's why they didn't paint it and that's why they had to pull the sea lion whiskers out so they they renovated it at least once in its past while it was in native use and they tried to repair those cracks, those lashings and those nails, trying to hold it in place, were done long ago, uh, square nails from the 1800s. And so they, they tried to salvage it and keep it alive as long as possible. When they came to the Smithsonian, the, the wood cylinder they thought was a little strange. They weren't used to seeing that. And uh, they went next door to the museum and they were American Indian and they found this hat, which they uh, very similar to it, but in the form of a frog and with a almost the same cylinders, they think the same artist might have made these. And so they saw that and they said, we think that's Kick City too, so we're convinced this is definitely a Kick City hat. And it was recorded as being from Sitka. So they wanted to follow as close as possible uh, traditional protocols. So they wanted to make sure that Eagles made the hat. So they had the Eagles start by scanning the hat. And here Andy Gamble is starting with scanning the hat and then they turned it over to the digitization program office. Ray took a quick turn on it uh, to test it out and then turned it over to the digitization office to make sure they got every little detail on it. And they wanted to make sure that the um, hat was milled by the opposites as well. And so <laughs> this is giving me, awesome. yeah, yeah jumping. jumping, apologize. So uh, um, it's gonna make people have convulsions here in a second. Um, <laughs> So uh, they asked, who's gonna be doing the milling if we do this? And we said, well, Chris Halschwander, he's in exhibits, he does that with that machine. And uh, they started asking questions about him and uh, wanted to meet him. And uh, we brought him forward and they said, well, the Caguantan are gonna have to adopt you because uh, the eagles have to make this hat, the, the wolves have to make this hat. And so we had a ceremony with the hat and the one from the Museum of the American Indian at the museum and uh, they adopted him. It was quite a big surprise. Should have seen his eyes go, <laughs> <laughs> when they saucers. told him. 
Then the next challenge was how do we actually do this? How do we get it done? We got a grant from the Smithsonian Women's Committee to help fund the project to acquire wood and materials. Boy, it's jumping back and forth. And uh, then the wood, we had the help of people here in, in Juneau. They got alder from right here locally, big, big logs. George Reifenstein, Joe Zuboff helped with that and shipped them. Got uh, four of, I think four of everything, just in case there were cracks or flaws in the wood. Didn't want to have to uh, make mistakes again twice. And um, the Cook City authorized us just like the Dr. Louie did, did authorized us to make a second copy so the museum could keep to teach with. And the second piece they said should be out of cedar because it wasn't intended to be dance. They wanted alder for the first one because it was gonna be stronger than the cedar. They didn't want it to crack like the ancient hat did. So they, we got cedar from uh, Huna and uh, Bob helped us with uh, uh, getting some wood there and finding it and uh, that also was a big, big shipment. And the cylinders, the potlatch cylinders on top are out of the cedar. Carolyn. All right, so, um after the digitization office uh, scanned, and I think they also, they also did photogrammetry, and we also had um, CT scan data. So um, the first order of business was to repair this part of the hat. Uh, I worked with Chris Holschwander as to what holes uh, needed to stay, um, or at least put markers. We put markers in it so we could re-drill them, right? Yeah. Um, so I would take, so where we see the green, that's where I removed uh, all the cracks that are in the hat. And then I digitally repaired them and uh, smoothed them over, removed all the sinew, removed all the lashing, um, merged uh, CT scan data from the inside of the, the cylinder with the, um, the scan, the um, scan data from the outside, which was a pretty tedious job. Um, and then as you can see, I mirrored one half to place it where the big missing piece was. And so those are, so on the left is the original and then you can see the, uh, the scan, the, go back. Yeah, and so that's the repaired one on the right, digital repair. And then that's the, um, the cylinder on top. That is from the photogrammetry data. That probably was from uh, CT data. And then you can go forward. Um, and the yellow is our areas that where I had to remove uh, the cracks that were in there and then um, refill them. So, you, so it could be milled properly in one piece instead of with all the, all the cracks. And so here's the milling. Chris, why don't you move over here? Sure. As long as my head's not blocking the ass for you. Okay, after the uh, digital reconstruction was done, uh, it would have been, I think, August of uh, 2017, I started to uh, perform the CNC machining. And my first task was to i uh, take the data and I wanted to prove out all of the uh, tool pads and make sure the machine was calibrated and running properly before I went to uh, machining the full size pieces because they were uh, pretty large and we went through a lot to get the wood brought down from Alaska and everything. So I wanted to make sure that my process was pretty well thought out. So I was able to get permission to create a half scale prototype so I could design all my fixturing and make sure I had a very good game plan for uh, the final pieces. And I brought along the half scale uh, prototype with me to the uh, conference so it could be uh, shown as part of the process of the project. And I also use this whenever we have tours and uh, we get a lot of uh, school age kids to come through our shop uh, to learn about the Smithsonian behind the scenes. And I use this to tell the story since I don't have access to the uh, full size copy that uh, we have at Natural History. That comes out on, that'll come out on special occasions. Talk, let's talk about the process for the, for making the full size, we're still. Okay, I wasn't sure where we were at as far as. Yeah, look, the, uh, look to the left, project. yeah. 
Okay. Now, after this was done, then uh, we moved into the, uh, the machining of the full-size pieces. We stored the pieces in the freezer over at MSC and then brought them over to our shop. I prepared them, uh, got them down to a reasonable size that I could put them inside the CNC milling machine. And here I'm beginning to uh, start the roughing stage of the alder and the yellow cedar. I machined it from the inside first, then flipped it over and machined it from the outside so it had a rough form. And then from there, as with uh, anybody who's uh, familiar with carving or bowl turning, what I had to do was I had to go through a drying period. So at that point, I took both hats and I basically stored them in uh, cardboard boxes and a bed of their own chips and let them dry out slowly for about 30 days to uh, a month and a half. And during that time frame, I uh, brought the, uh, the half-scale replica to Sitka to the Sharing Our Knowledge Conference back in 2017 to meet with Ray, discuss the project, and make sure that I was headed in the right direction, and he felt comfortable with everything that I was doing. We consulted throughout the process at each stage, thanks to KTOO uh, for providing those facilities at this end on Juno, so that really helped bridge it, and here you can see uh, them observing and talking with Carolyn as she was digitally repairing the inside of the hat. So that connected us with Marilyn in real time. And they could see it being milled in real time. It's a deafening machine there, but we had to pause it a couple times. Chris, add anything if you want. Yeah, well, I mean, one of the things with the video conferencing, we wanted to make sure that uh, they were kept apprised of the, the project from beginning to the end. So we wanted to have like their constant buy-in, their approval, and their guidance on everything to, to validate the collaboration. We also collaborated long distance on what was attached to the hat, and they asked us to do more in-depth studies on what might have been in the holes or attached to the holes. And there were little bits of hair stuck in the paint and stuck under splinters underneath, maybe from a former clan owner who wore it, little bits of feathers stuck in holes and cracks here and there. You can see that it looks like it had no teeth, but the clan leaders over the phone there, they said, did it have teeth? Look closer. And we got a light and looked up in a little socket there and found a little trace of opercular shell stuck in one of the sockets and we got to add teeth and uh, so it, it really helped to have that it was as if they were right there with us examining the hats and they asked us to do studies of the materials that were on it and so we took little samples of the hair little samples of the feather and the leather and the sinew had them analyzed by protein analysts to tell was it ermine or walrus or uh, and we found those a goat uh, probably mountain goat was on there as well hairs of deer hairs of human were confirmed hairs of ermine and the feathers were swan down so that enabled them to be informed about what to attach to it they also did mass spectrometer analysis of the paint and of the surfaces there and we found nicotine uh, all over it, which we didn't expect. And so we, we, we think that maybe they were blowing smoke on it. There was nicotine on all surfaces of it, except very little on the top of the, of the uh, platform there. there. Maybe that was protected by the cylinder at the time and less underneath from the wear. So maybe it was exposed to smoke while it's sitting out on blankets or something and they blew smoke onto it. It's a speculation, but it opens up some interesting ideas for, for what, uh, what to look for in the future. It's the most studied object in the Smithsonian now. We know more about it. So among the materials, we knew there was uh, sap that was holding the down at the top. So George went out and collected some sap. They shot a deer for the hide and sinew. Lo so local Alaskan deer were used in the making of the hat. And now back to you, Chris. Okay, after the uh, drying period uh, for both of the hats, I uh, went through essentially the same process as in the beginning to machine the hat, both hats. I had to uh, position it from uh, multiple angles, then I put it on our rotary axis and I could actually machine it in a round. So I could, I could essentially turn it 360 degrees while it was machining and I gradually stepped down from larger bits to smaller bits to attain all the details. Once all the milling work was done, then it was time to paint it and make attachments to it. So Ray asked 
Joe Garfield to come to the Smithsonian to help teach and guide us in doing it. Even though he's a raven, he was guiding the eagles uh, to work on the hat. And so we worked together to do how to attach things and paint things to assemble the cylinders. Garfield George was able to come down from New York for a couple days to observe the process. The Women's Committee stopped by to see how their money's being spent. <laughs> <laughs> Again, thank you, Women's Committee. Because there were, we think there were sea lion whiskers on the back, we made room, the, the clan wanted sea lion whiskers on it as well, but not in the same array, because you couldn't do both. You couldn't have the cape on it and whiskers unless you move the whiskers a little bit to the side. So representing the spray of the water or coming from it. Cape. Or puncture the cape, yeah, which they didn't want to do. You see there's a little bit of differences with it. They, they chose, they like the green that they have for their frog hat and many of their clans today, so they'd rather have the green than the blue. You see this has shell inlaid eyes where the original didn't, but it had little fine incised circles in those blue eyes as if the artists wanted to put inlays in there if they could afford it or if they could get the material. So they wanted to finish what their ancestors couldn't and they put shell inlays in the center there. And one thing that we were uh, we were doing as uh, we were working on the, the project during like the final week here where we were doing a lot of the finishing work is uh, we were doing some carving on the uh, the two two replicas in order to crisp in some of the details and uh, put in some of the uh, like finer elements of hand carving that the original hat has because you while you can get down very close in uh, resolution with uh, milling cutters and everything it it's a very long process and a lot of what we were trying to do is still keep some traditional methods even though we're using modern technology and going in in the end to do some of the hand carving uh doing the uh, shell inlays for the eyes doing the inlay for the teeth it puts the traditional aspect into it So if you didn't get a chance to see it last night, this is, sorry, this is the close we can, closest we can do now. It's owned by the Kick City now. It'll only come out when they want it to. Gunakshish. Gunakshish. It's also in today's newspaper if you want to see it there. <laughs> you can put it on your Shameless wall. Shameless plug. <laughs> <laughs> Any questions? Lauren's got one too. So I was just curious, how long did that process of machining it take and like equate that to actually hand carving a duplicate instead of the machining? Uh, it, took the, it took a period of about, uh, let's see, two and a half to three months off and on. Uh, a lot of it was, especially with the, uh, the alder and the cedar, I would prep it uh, in the morning. I, I prepped the, uh, the logs in the morning, got them right into the machine because they were wet wood. I mean, they were harvested here, shipped on a uh, pallet as soon as possible down to me in uh, DC. So, and they went into cold storage. So I prepped the blanks, got them into the machine. I would do a little bit of, bit of machining that day and I would pull it out of the machine at the end of uh, my day of work, put it back in a freezer. So it, it took weeks, door, I mean, throughout the machining during the green stage and then the drying and then the machining during the, uh, the finishing stage. But so the actual machining portion was probably about three, three and a half months, including the half scale prototype. Carvers were telling us that this process is similar for them too, that they carve a little bit on it, they set it aside, they let it, they chill it, they let it, uh, they watch how it responds to that. And, and so 
Right. Well, you may know better than us what it takes for and, uh, a and traditional the techniques carver. I, and the techniques I used are, are more like uh, what bowl turners use where when they're working in uh, green wood. They're, and they're saving all of their shavings. So, and then uh, one, and they freeze them as well. So once uh, the bowl is uh, roughed out, then it's put in a bed of shavings that, and it's slowly dried over, I mean, depending on the size, it could be a couple of weeks to a month and a half to two months if it's uh, something that's like pretty good size and has some relative thickness to it. Any other questions? Well, we want to thank the Alaska State Museum for hosting this part of the conference, but also hosting us here and allowing us to uh, bring the Sculpin Hat repli repli replica and the original up. They allowed us to store it in their climate controlled and secure facilities to allow us to be able to conduct the ceremonies and make it available for ceremonies for the Kick City last night. And you saw the case, the exhibit case that they brought out for it to help keep it under climate control conditions in the space, the cart that they actually made and put together for it. So we really want to thank the Alaska State Museum for what they've done and for helping us with uh, the room next door that will be in the next three days if you want to come and see this in action or dive deeper into some of these discussions and look at some of the more prints and other objects and that room if I didn't mention is available what we're doing there is uh, for clan leaders uh, and, and tribes to bring forward objects if they want us to digitize them to set aside the files for security for them so people are are bringing them in and so you may get to see some real objects being worked on uh, as you come and if you have something that you think um, might be appropriate uh, feel free to come talk to us Good night, Shish. Good night, Shish.